Hi, today I will interview a composer from Colombia, Rodolfo Acosta. Hi, Rodolfo. Hi, Sandris, how are you? I'm good. And uh, the first question is, uh, what is good music for you, right? What is good musical composition for you? Well, uh, I would say that, first of all, it depends on what, the, what use we're, we're thinking about the music for. Meaning, you know, music has many, or musics in, in, in plural, uh, musics have many social uses. And so it depends which music we're talking about and what we're using it for. So one thing would be a good composition if we're talking about dancing. Another one would be if we're talking about um, driving at night. Another one would be for ritual listening, which is how I feel about the concert space, for example. Um, so it depends on, on, on what kind of music it is, but not only what kind of music it is, but also what we're using it for. Because one music may be used for, uh, you know, maybe thought by the composer and the performer for one use, and then it's used some in, in some other way. For example, once we were in the middle of a party here at home uh, and we dance, I mean, we're in Bogota, everybody dances. And uh, so we usually dance salsa, merengue, stuff like that. But somebody put on uh, Music for 18 Musicians by Steve Reich, and we all started dancing it together. We, it, was, it was an amazing experience, of course. Reich didn't consider the piece for that, uh, for people dancing it in a party, but it was, it was an awesome experience. So for example, in that evening, I discovered certain aspects of, of that composition, new aspects that I thought were good for that use that we were giving it. Now, since we're talking about here, you and I about, about contemporary music, about new music, experimental music, um, I'm going to go back to my teacher, uh, Graciela Parasquevaidis. She was brilliant, and she would say that uh, for her, a good composition had to stimulate, and she would signal her body. She'd say, here, here, and here. <laughs> so it was her head, her heart, and her gut. So um, so she she would need the music, like the piece. She was always talking about, about academic music. So she would need to, to feel stimulation and intellectual stimulus. She would need uh, an affective stimulus and a physical stimulus. Um, I would say that definitely for me, part of it has to do with the, 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 the physical stimulus, but most especially through listening. Listening as part of the body experience. Of course, I insist. I dance very often. Uh, we dance very often in Bogota. Uh, so there's also that other aspect of, of physicality. But listening for me is a strongly physical experience. So that has to happen. But also there's something, I'm not going to say intellectual, but something about, about the brain, something about the thinking, something about the asking questions uh, that is extremely important for me. So within that space, of let's call it, uh, I don't know, concert music or Western academic music or, or whatever, there's, there's that aspect that has to be important. And I must say that it's also different. Uh, I, I listen to music every day, many different types of musics. And within Western academic music, I listen to a lot of new music, but also a lot of old music. And it's different, you know, it's different what I look for when I'm listening to say 19th century music, whereas when I'm listening to 21st century music. So there's different situations. So I guess what this last thing that I was answering would be more along the lines of, of contemporary music, you know, what, what I look for in contemporary music. And can you give just an example maybe of the last piece which, uh, which touch all the senses that you said? Well, for example, in the last two weeks, since I returned home, I was, I was abroad uh, working. In the last two weeks, I've listened to a lot of Mario La Vista, the great Mexican composer who died the day I arrived. And so I was very happy to be returning home. And all of a sudden on the cab from the airport to my apartment, we received the news of Mario's death. And so in 
these two weeks, I've been listening to a lot of, of his music. And I think that happens in a lot of his music and especially his chamber pieces and especially his solo pieces, for example, for flute, for oboe, for uh, bassoon, just these incredibly magical pieces which really move me in, in every aspect. And then I'm gonna go back to Graciela and say also this, the idea of the heart, right? Uh, this affective situation. So, um, so I would say that I've been listening to a lot of uh, Mario Lavista's chamber music in the last couple of weeks. And I think those are great examples of pieces that stimulate me in, in all these three different levels. Yes, uh, and um, just looking right on yourself, what do you think? What is your maybe musical idea or signature, right? Which you, which you, uh, kind of back and back and back, right? What interesting? Uh, what is uh, your interest in music, right? Okay, um, you sent me some of these questions last night, and I, I, I checked them out, and I must say that I was perplexed by them. Uh, I I feel that well, some are very difficult to answer. I mean, we could talk for hours, for days, and some I'm not sure if I understand. The first one that I don't, I, I don't really feel that I understand is this idea of this, this notion of the, of the signature, and I'm not sure what you mean by it. And, um, and it's, it's curious because two nights ago, uh, I came across the same thing in a translation. Uh, there were the, the program notes of a CD of... Um, <laughs> Poriuna Haronian, the yes. Uruguayan composer, a, a CD by the wonderful German ensemble, uh, Ensemble Aventure. And the, the, the person who wrote the notes, who was uh, uh, at, at that point, I think it was Wolfgang Rüdiger. Uh, oh no, the, it, was, it was somebody else. But in any case, they talked about the signature. And so I wonder if you mean by the signature, uh, something that makes my compositions recognizable or when you talk about the musical idea is what I think music is or what I think um, he is. So I yeah, don't know. I just, uh, no, I just thought maybe there is something, right? Which is uh, your constant interest, right? You, you're usually coming back and coming back. Uh, I don't know whether you want to like extend some algorithms or, or you, uh, let's say, or you extend or create some kind of new musical language, right? Or something which usually you know when you something which you uh, which you catch yourself that you coming back coming back and coming back right it could be uh, maybe formal language a signature but it could be some kind of I don't know idea or some questioning yourself right you're saying okay who who am I right as Colombian for example right or who am I as Colombian or South American composer. Or uh, this is things. Uh, what uh, what this question is about is okay. I'm gonna give a terrible answer, <laughs> a useless answer. Um, I guess I I keep I keep coming back to the idea that I have no, for example, no style and no interest in having a style. Um, I have the very strong feeling that. Uh, my work as a composer has to do with like perceiving some sort of music that already exists. This sounds ridiculous, but but it, it's very much how I feel it. Like if it existed in another dimension and like I, if I had li like little antennas that, that perceived them, it's not actually so mystical. It could be like a radio, like, yes. you know, like, like an old radio, you pull out the antenna and it perceives... Uh, you know, radio waves that are around us, but that we can't hear. And that simple mechanism sort of like socializes the music. So that's very much how I feel about my work as a composer. So that means that I have a very strong feeling that each piece, it's very much its own world. Yes. Of preoccupation, of sound, of technique, of uh, aesthetics, whatever. Um, but looking back, I mean, I've been composing for half of my life, which that would mean I've been composing for like 25, 26 years, um, constantly composing um, and composing a lot of, of pieces. And uh, so I do remember that, for example, early on, 
Um, I was very inter interested in finding uh, stimuli for composition, maybe in, uh, in mathematics or in physics or in chemistry, um, in other cases uh, in visual arts or in poetry or in literature. Uh, but then I started thinking more about, well, what matters most to me, which is music. And, um, and so time and sound, and for example, this very sort of mystical relationship between sound production, uh, resonance and silence, which in a certain sense has a lot to do with life and death. Um, and, um, and I, I guess lately, lately meaning the last maybe 10 years or something, I guess I concentrate more and more on this idea of the of the the piece that is there pre-existing somewhere mm -hmm. my responsibility is to bring it to this dimension and 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 socialize it yeah share yeah. it with with other people and um I don't want to sound uh, like pseudo mystical or anything like that these are just some some things that have that I can find in in the way I've been composing in these last 25 years. Yeah, and you said, right, that, uh, that, that before that, before some time, it was usually science and uh, that triggers the stimuli, right? And recently, what are the stimuli which triggers, uh, no, no, triggers? Well, it's, it's, When, whenever the, the situation to compose arises, be it because something happens in the world around me uh, and I feel the need to compose or be it a commission or what, whatever, whatever uh, reason sets off uh, the situation uh, to compose, what I do is contemplate, contemplate um, that first triggering aspect. It could be, for example, a person, somebody who asks for a composition. So I contemplate that person, my relationship with that person, how that person acts, how that person seems to think, of course, how that person sings or plays or, or whatever. But oftentimes our relationships, or if it's an ensemble, for example, the inner relationships between the people in that ensemble, um, what I think they are or what I think they should be, um, et cetera, et cetera. So I guess compositional situation from compositional situation, um, it changes. But what would be in common is my idea of contemplating the situation to try and find through the situation um, a possible music. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh... I just uh, thinking right uh, um, how 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 the fact that you're living let's say in Bogota right how it did how it, how it influenced uh, your music right what would be different so that if you would live in other uh, in other in other continent or in a, or uh, in a in completely another city mm -hmm. it would be it's 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 very hard I mean it completely defines me. Um, and I know it completely defines me because uh, I've made it a point to, to be here, to be in my country, to be in my city, to be a musician of and for my city um, and my country and my continent, of course, and my world. But very much uh, being in Bogota is enormously important for me. And I know, I'm convinced that it defines me, but it's very hard to pinpoint it from my perspective, yes. it would be like asking a fish, what does it feel like to be in water all the time? The fish doesn't even know it's in water, you know, it's yes. it's, its entire existence. Um, but for example, I remember, um, you know, I just mentioned Mario Lauista. Some years ago, I composed a, an electroacoustic piece, which I dedicated to him, called um, um, El Monocuco Chapineruno. And it's, 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 untranslatable. <laughs> um, but I remember during the compositional process, this may sound silly, but it's a fact, 
I want it to be, uh, you know, the, the peace to be a result of a conscious contemplation of being in Bogota. So I would, I'm in the middle of a, of a very hectic neighborhood, which is Chapinero. And I would walk to the corner of 53rd and 9th, and I would sit there for hours contemplating the city and mentally begging my city to tell me its secrets, um, to tell me what it is, what mm -hmm. is, is its essence. Um, and I, I have no answer, but, but that was part, an essential part of the compositional process. Um, now, I, I try to be in, let's, we're in the middle of this damn pandemic, so things have been very different in the last couple of years. But I constantly try to be, you know, in the street, in the bars, in the clubs, in the concert halls, in the schools. Um, so I'm constantly in contact with the city, uh, with the people, with the traffic, with the, <laughs> the energy, with the, the fantastic noise around me. Um, so I'm permeated by it. I can't specifically say pointed out you know what, what's the characteristic but i know i'm convinced that i'm a product of bogota yes 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 and it's uh, very interesting because bef uh, before we started the conversation right we, we touch one piece of of yours we're actually uh, very local let's say maybe not bogota but, but i presume colombian right uh, Col colombian story is played out right about very yes. You brought up uh, Verdaderos Negativos. Uh, that one is translatable and, and should be translated. It means uh, true negatives, and it's a twist of terms from falsos positivos, which is false positives, which in this case uh, is referring to uh, the practice of the armed forces of Colombia during the government of um, Alvaro Uribe Vélez, of basically murdering young civilians to pass them off as casualties of the war between the, the, the government, that government specifically, and uh, the guerrilla, the armed forces, like the, the guerrilla forces, the left-wing guerrilla forces, and especially FARC. Um, so it, was, it is a terrible tragedy that uh, because of the pressure of the government, uh, the armed forces, what they were doing, were just going out and killing civilians to pass them off as casualties of war. So uh, once again, this verdaderos negativos, this true negatives, is because, you know, how can you talk about the death of people, in the end, anyone, as something positive? You know, even if it's a false positive, you're saying that it's something positive. I understand the idea of the positive results, but it's, it's tragic. Yes, it's absolutely yeah. tragic. So, of course, what it is is true negatives. So, it does have to do with Colombia, of course, with many parts of the world, because it, this isn't something that only happens here. Uh, but it also has to do with Bogota, and especially neighborhoods uh, and and like small towns near Bogota, where a lot of this happened. Mm -hmm. It's very interesting. And um, do you frequently write music? Uh, let's say, in connection with, with these stories, lines, what's going on in, in Bogota and surroundings? Is it something which you do often? Um, I, would, I would say no, but many people around me make me realize that yes, that I do. Uh, I would say no because I kind of hate the idea that to be a, a recognized artist uh, in countries like mine, um, you have to have, you know, it's it's like the official artist is a sort of left-wing intellectual right. 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 social commentary. And I'm sick of that, you know, it, it, I hate it. Uh, but I don't know, what are you gonna do? It, it, it's so, it's so uh, heart-wrenching that, you know, these situations, of course, you know they're they're going through you constantly, and um, so of course it comes up in the comp in the composition, and oftentimes it is what they have to do with centrally, but it's not, let's say, a, 
a story. It's not like musicalizing a situation. It's not a, a narrative. It's not like uh, some sort of uh, tone poem about it or anything like that. No, I'm not trying to represent anything. I am at a certain point uh, heartbroken about a given situation or happy about another type of situation. And it's the feeling that uh, sort of possesses me uh, to, to, to compose something or compose in some way or whatever. You know, I'm not trying to tell stories because it, it would be terribly disrespectful to the victims in this case to try to, to uh, like symbolize and also exploit their suffering. Mm -hmm. You know, for my benefit as a composer, that would be terribly disrespectful. So, so no, I, I don't try to picture anything. Uh, I just try to, I just try to, you know, live and compose and feel. And, um, and oftentimes these types of situations do come up. And I would say that most of the time, uh, for example, political reflections in, in my in my music, and here I'm going to say that, of course, I'm mainly a composer, but I'm also a performer, especially conductor, and, uh, and an improviser. So when I say my music, I would say that all these different aspects of my music making, um, whenever I try to, say, reflect politically or, or sociologically, I try to not have it be something like very superficial, very obvious, but usually I try to bring it into, for example, structural aspects of the composition, you know, meaning how the, the performers relate to one another uh, in uh, a given piece, that having to do with, say, for something like a political model or something like that. Yes, good, good. And, um... What do you think, what is like, what is your sources of musical language, right? Is it somehow um, Western, uh, like new Western music, or it's somehow you mixing with uh, a lot of uh, music which you hear maybe on the streets or clubs in, in, in Bogota? Well, um, all of the above. <laughs> D, all of the above. Um, because a lot of what we hear in the street is Western classical music. So um, this is, I think, an important aspect. Um, so I'm, I, I will be very precise about it. Um, Colombia exists, has been existing for 200 years. My city, Bogota, has, been, has existed since the, uh, like 1538, since the, the, the first third of the, or the beginning of the second third of the 16th century. Um, so the story of what happens in the city is much longer than the story of what happens in the country. Right. The idea of the country, and especially the idea of nationality, which is something completely different, you know, nationality is a concept of what supposedly defines a given group of people. You know, this is a recent invention. And I underline invention because somebody sits down and invents what it is to supposedly be Colombian or Venezuelan, or whatever, um, or German. Yes. Um, so, you know, this is a construct. Uh, the same thing may happen with the city, but at least the fact that the, the history is so much longer uh, makes it more complex and therefore, I think, more real. Uh, so, for example, my city was founded, as all Hispanic cities were uh, during the European Renaissance, um, with a mass. So a, a mass in 1538 created my city and the Western academic music tradition comes from, well, uh, Christian music. You know, that's the beginning uh, of this tradition. So my city was created with, was founded with music of Western academic tradition. So it's ingrained in our culture and our culture is Western culture, of course, we have to accept that there's a difference and we have to realize and understand that there's a difference between European culture and Western culture, which is a, a fact given through imperialism and especially worldwide imperialism starting at the end of the 15th century. You know, uh, Western tradition, Western culture starts becoming more and more complex 
as European powers start spreading throughout the world and things sort of change. Just as an example, uh, in the 16th century, uh, for example, in the wars between uh, reform and counter-reform in uh, Central and Western Europe, you know, one of the, one of the aspects that uh, the Reformation churches were discussing and that were being opposed by the Roman church had to do with language, you know, what language mass is carried out in. So for example, uh, I don't know, Martin Luther was talking about the use of German in, um, in the, the church and there was this whole debate and there were wars and there were deaths and there were everything. And the Roman Catholic church only started using, for example, Spanish in mass after the Second Vatican Council in the 1960s. We're talking about 60 years ago. But the Roman Catholic Church started doing mass in indigenous American languages in the 16th century, at the same time that they were prohibiting the use of vernacular languages in Europe, they were accepting and promoting the use of Native American languages in the church in the Americas. So yeah. we had mass being conducted in Quechua, in Aymara, in Nahuatl, et cetera, here in the Americas, starting in the 16th century. You can check out, for example, the Lima, the three Lima councils of the 16th century to find information about that. So it's, it's very interesting how we start seeing when we really uh, study it, how we start seeing that as this imperialism begins, of course, there's an aspect of transculturalism, meaning transculturalism, not interculturalism. The idea trans that we can take a culture and simply place it on another population. Of course, that's a central idea of European imperialism. Yes, but the fact is that things change. Once it's placed on another population, that culture starts to change, starts to mix, starts to react to its new necessities. Mm -hmm. That being said, Western academic music is part of the culture of the Americas, has been part of the, uh, the culture of the Americas for half a millennium. That's an extremely long time. This is before, uh, before all, the, all the great composers of the European canon, you know, this is way before. So there's been this, this whole system that's included the Americas for half a millennium. The problem is that a lot of people are extremely ignorant and lazy about it. Mm -hmm. So of course, they don't know it, they don't understand it, and they don't even see themselves in the mirror when they look at themselves. They only see this, this very simple caricature, for example, of what it is to be Colombian and what it means to be Colombia supposedly, because the elite said so, is these, uh, I don't know, three, four types of, of traditional music, but it's not true. The, the, the truth is way more complex. So that being said, the music that I hear in the streets includes Western academic music, includes rock, includes uh, ballenato, includes bujerengue, includes, well, so on and so forth. And being in a city like Bogota, large urban Western city of uh, 9 million people, well, you end up hearing a lot of other stuff, music from, from Africa, from Asia, maybe not so much from Oceania, but a little bit. Um, so, so you really, in a city like Bogota, if you go out and you live the city, you come into contact with so much stuff that, that it's like peeking into the entire world. And um, I think that's a, a really great opportunity for like as a composer, because you're in contact with so much stuff that it really just blows your mind day after day after day if you go out and look for it. Yes, um, and I just I'm thinking now, right? We started a conversation uh, with one interesting thing, uh, what you said, that uh, when are you in Bogota, everything is about dancing, right? <laughs> and I just thought, and uh, listening to uh, what I told uh, the piece, right? I, I can imagine a little bit I can dance. How music is, how your music is danceable, right? Um, or, you know, I maybe would, uh, I say that Paul's that body. Uh, 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 some, some of the music, uh, I wouldn't say my music, but some of the music that I've composed 
uh, surely is danceable. Um, and it's in different senses of, of dance. Um, it could be a way of, uh, an idea of dance, meaning kind of like the story that I told about, about Steve Reich, which had a lot to do with, for example, dancing salsa. I mean, in that same party that I was talking yeah. about, we were dancing salsa. Uh, but it can also be other types of dance. For example, we just had a performance in uh, near Strasbourg um, with a, a piece called Fluge for bass, flute, and piano. And it was done with dance because in the score itself, it says it's a piece for bass, flute, and piano, but it could also work very well with dance, uh, with meaning in, in the idea of contemporary dance. Uh, or for example, uh, we're gonna premiere a piece in, in uh, Montreal next year, which is called Dance Machine. It's an ensemble piece that is actually uh, very much thought of from the perspective of, of, of dance. It's not for dance, but it's, it's the idea of, okay, I'm composing as somebody who, who, who really dances, who, for whom dance has been important in my daily life. Um, as a matter of identity, you know, identity, and this is another important aspect. Identity is, is a very complex thing, very beautiful and complex thing. Meaning, for example, a central aspect of my identity is that I'm a Bogotano. Yes. Yes. Also that I'm a metalero. I've listened to heavy metal my entire life. And that's also a dance aspect. I mean, you go... Uh, you go to an, an anthrax concert, what do you do? You thrash, of course, you mosh. That's, that's dancing. And for me, that's just as important as dancing salsa. So in a piece like Dance Machine, there will be all, these, all this thought about dancing because I dance constantly, uh, but expressed as a music to be listened to. But I think that there will be this idea that you were talking about how you reacted to verdaderos negativos, which is your body starts to move. Maybe you don't quite know what you're supposed to do with your body because it's, it's, it's thought of as a music for sitting down and listening to, you know, concert ritual, but, but the body wants to move. And I think oh, that, that's, that, that's pretty cool. But a lot of my music, I would say that it takes into account the body, but maybe as something that wants to be specifically still. A lot of my uh, of my pieces seem to be very static, work yes. with very low sounds and like very soft sounds. I mean, uh, where a lot of silence and stuff like that. And I think that also has to do with the contemplation of the body. But in terms of let's be very still and very so quiet. oppression, right, of the body in both moments, right? Did you say oppression? Yes, yes, I said oppression. Yes. Okay, no, uh, not for me. But it's very interesting that you say so because my main teachers, Coriuna Aronian and Graciela Parasquebaiz, they used to talk about their like silence, the use of silence in their music having to do with oppression. And it had to do with their experiences of the, of the military dictatorships in Uruguay and in Argentina uh, back when they were young. Um, but for me, no. For me, silence does not mean that at all it has to do with contemplation it has to do with uh, i don't meditate but i'm gonna say it has to do with meditation yeah. um i'm very banal i talk about these things and it, it sounds like i'm very mystical but no not at all but it has to do with that it has to do with this idea of in this world that is so hectic let's just stop but let's really stop and to perceive the other, we have to really, you know, one way is to move with the other, for example, dancing, or to be very still and really contemplate not only the other, but how the other affects the world around us. For example, there's a piece of mine called Loop, which is basically, it's a piece actually for a listening audience, mm -hmm. for a group of listeners. The performers are the listeners. Um, and it's, it uses a loop, um, bom, 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 that sounds for like, I don't know, like 40 or 50 minutes, I can't remember. And there's some instructions about how to move your body very gradually throughout the piece and to perceive sound. The, the piece is that, is perceive 
like to contemplate how your listening changes. And throughout this piece or this exercise or whatever it is, a, a lot of what you realize is how the other person affects the sound by his or her presence in the room. So you can only realize that if you really stay still, quiet, and open up your ears and your mind and your heart to the sound and to the world around you. Yes. Um, there is one question which triggers me, uh, which, uh, which I want to ask and ask and ask and ask and ask. But you, you started... Uh, 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 you started with ideas that you don't uh, that any like any any new work for you is like creation of new, something new, right? Of something, let's say, recreating your own musical uh, perspective, your own way of of doing things, right? Or seeing things. It, 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 then, for me, what triggers right? Why so? What what triggers you like? Any new work should be new, right? Completely new and... Uh... Okay. Um, if I understood correctly, the first part, when you were preparing the question, uh, I would disagree that that's my position. Um, I would say that, I have said, that, there's, that th there tends to be two different types of composers I'm oversimplifying, of course, but I tend to find two different types of composers. Some composers of a very, like, I would say a more like post Beethoven tradition of this is me, right? These are my thoughts, these are my feelings, and I want to share these feelings with the world. Or John Cage would say, I want to impose this feeling, my yeah. feelings and my personality on the world. Um, I'm not, I don't feel like I'm that kind of composer. The other kind of composer, which is more what I feel, is a composer um, through whom music passes, um, like a medium. Like you have to like empty yourself. Yes. Um, and let things go through you and go out into the world through you. But it's not your personality that is being imposed on the music or on the on the audience or on the performers. Um, but but it's just like I think it's it's the music. Um, that's how I feel. I know it's very naive, and I know that I am composing, and I, I'm sure that there's something of my personality there. I'm sure, but but I really try to not be in the way. I try to help but not be in the way. Uh, I feel very much the same about conducting. So you mean, so you mean by your, uh, your help, uh, your, you don't want, uh, let's say, abuse, uh, um, when you were saying that you want to like, let it go, right? I say understand, let music go. So it's idea that you are not stopping yourself, right? And imposing your personality uh, on it, right? This, this whatever you want to say, what, Correctly, I yes. understand this idea, right? Yes. So yes. it's like letting go, let music happen, right? Music happened somewhere and it happened with me, right? Particularly at that time, okay, that music, right? Yes. And um, I, th that makes sense with the fact that, that I've been so involved in improvisation. Um, and uh, also with the fact that as a composer and also as a performer, I've worked a lot with indeterminate music. So for example, as a composer working with indeterminate music, um, oftentimes I do it because I'm more interested in creating situations in which I can listen to the performers. Maybe, I'm, maybe it's that I'm more curious about the personalities of the performers than, or I would say rather the interpreters than my own personality. I don't wanna hear myself on stage. Um, yeah, I know that a lot of people do and, and, and use composition and use music um, as a way of like, like getting on stage and saying, this is me, this is me, this is me. Uh, I'm not really interested in that as a composer. As a listener, for example, I enjoy that very much. 
I enjoy, you know, the ego of, I don't know, of Stockhausen. I, I, I find it fascinating, but I don't want to have that ego at all. Um, I don't want that for me. So, um, so having said that, because of the fact that I try to search for pieces, I try to, to like intuitively perceive pieces somewhere, I don't know where, where they are, um, and try to bring them forth, sometimes the pieces are very different amongst themselves. So sometimes, for example, I was talking about indeterminism. So many pieces are extremely indeterminate, but others are extremely determinate. Uh, why? Because that's the, the way the piece was. So if, if I accept the challenge of writing that piece, yes. then I have to respect the fact that that piece wants to be determinate, wants to be very specific. You want that very specific rhythm with that very specific pitch, with that very specific timbre, with that very specific dynamic in that very specific place in the hall with that or with that movement or whatever. You know, if I accept, then I have an ethical compromise to the music, to the piece itself. So I have to mold my compositional technique to be able to respond respectfully to the needs of that piece. Got it, got it, this is very interesting. But uh, can you just then, uh, then, um, then explain how, what does it mean as compositional process for you? When, when it starts and what stage you should go till, uh, Till, till it's performed right, on the concert? Um, well, a lot, I do take into account that there's a, like a pre-compositional, pre a real pre-compositional um, period. What I mean by a real one is that a lot of people talk about pre-compositional work, you know, when, they're, when we're preparing say sketches or uh, calculating structures. No, for me, that is extremely compositional work. Yes. It's even the most important compositional work. Yes, yes, yes. Pre-compositional is before you're actually thinking about the piece. Um, once you start working out all the stuff, that's a compositional period. Another part is the, the, the writing period. You know, when you're actually choosing how you're going to write this piece, you know, if it's a text score, if it's a a, di a diastematic score, if it's one of the infinite possibilities of indeterminate scores, if it's a, a textual score, for example, a spoken score, uh, stuff like that. And then there's a period of, um, of uh, the preparation of the piece, you know, with performers. And I work very closely with performers constantly. Then there's the performance. And, uh, and then there's the, the post the post, meaning what happens in individual memory and in collective memory. Yes. Um, so this is like the whole aspect of, of this very mysterious ontological phenomenon about music, you know, where, where it's not that, that object, but it's this whole process and this whole process that has to do with both individuals and small and large collectives. So it's it's a mystery. It's a beautiful mystery. And, and speaking about this pre-composition, right? Because it's your words, right? So what is um, what is your practice? What you do? I don't know. You you listen to a lot of other music, or you thinking about, or you reading something, or you writing some schemes, or 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 you you know drawing something. What's going on in that uh, stage? Okay, the real pre-compositional meaning before there's um, there's any idea of what I'm going to compose or that I have to compose um, is how I expose myself, I would say, to, to new experiences. So for example, of course, there's listening. I listen to music every day, every day. I don't compose every day. I don't conduct every day. I don't improvise every day but I listen to music every single day. So I make it a point in fact to listen to music that I don't know. Um, that's a way for me of preparing. Yes. I cook, I cook a lot. 
um, I go out into the city and, uh, you know, live the city. Um, I read, um, yeah. Uh, I guess exposition to visual arts with, with this with this whole pandemic has gone down a lot, yeah. fortunately. Um, I watch a lot of movies. I watch you know stuff like that. Um, so it's exposing myself to to experiences, and of course, most importantly, through music. Yes. Um, but then there's an aspect like once there's something is in, in one way or another is planted like a seed. For example, now, right now, I know that I have a commission for Ensemble Aventure. I was talking about Ensemble Aventure and I was talking about how I listened to uh, a CD of theirs um, uh, like two days ago. Well, I now have prepared next to my stereo five CDs of theirs that I'm going to listen to because I'm going to compose for them because I want to if I can't be with them physically, at least listen to, to, to traces of what they've done. And that's what recordings are. You know, yes. Traces of what people have done as a group. So I want to immerse myself in that because eventually I'm going to compose for them. So I want to feel a little bit, you know, what may be uh, the sound of, of uh, Wolfgang Rüdiger is or uh, Akiko Okabe or the types of relationships that they create in different pieces or whatever, or we write each other. For me, that's already part of the compositional process. Even if I haven't started thinking and I don't want to start thinking yet about what the piece is going to be like, the fact that I'm talking with them or writing them or stuff like that, for me, is already part of the compositional yes. process because I want it to be about people. Yes, this is very interesting, right? So, so just uh, to understand, right? So you engage your experiences, right? And then the, for me, it's very inter uh, interesting um, the point. So after that, you have some kind of conceptual idea or you are already uh, hearing some, some internal voice which are already creating some music. Um, because I teach a lot, I not only listen to music every day, but I think about music every day constantly. Um, that means that I have compositional ideas every day, all the time. If I could, I don't know, if I could be like Neo and plug myself in, I could download thousands of, <laughs> of pieces. I just don't have the time and, uh, well, it's impossible. But I constantly imagine possible pieces. So part of what I have to do is, be, is, is rather silence some of them so that I can concentrate on one. Um, and a Colombian composer called Gustavo Parra once said that, um, one of the, that he actually said that the main aspect of composition was editing, meaning taking out things that shouldn't be there. Yes. Not every idea that you have should be in the piece. I remember an album by Metallica when, you know, when Metallica started becoming a, a lousy band after they'd been a great band. So I think the first downhill album was uh, And Justice For All. And to me, it was the first downhill album because they could put everything in the album and they put everything in the album. They didn't pay attention to the producer who told them, you shouldn't include this, you shouldn't include that. No, they, with their enormous egos, said, we're going to put everything because now we can. Now the record yeah. company believes in us. Um, and they didn't edit. And so what could have been a great album was just a good album. You know, it happened to Guns N' Roses, Guns N Roses as well with this double album with uh, Use Your Illusion. You know, if they had edited and made a single album, it would have been fantastic, maybe as good as Appetite for Destruction, but it wasn't. It was just, it was just good because there was many good songs, but many really shouldn't have been there. So as a composer, a lot of the time you do the same thing. You have a million ideas and maybe you have to say, okay, this piece, there's this one piece that's raising its hand saying, compose me, compose me. Um, and that one has to do with this and this and this, but no more. The yeah. other 20 ideas that I have floating around have to do, for example, with me 
with my ego, with my personality, with my interests, but maybe not with that piece. And I've actually had to recompose some pieces yes. because you are as saying, a composer, I lose control. Okay, when you are saying musical ideas, you are saying about text, conceptual text in your mind, or already some, some music, some sounds. It could be sounds, it could be techniques, it could be theories. Um, I, was, I was just saying that, for example, I've had to recompose pieces in the past, not, not as, a, as an idea of making it better, but for example, uh, years ago, I wrote a woodwind quintet um, called Wind. And um, I had to rewrite it three times because I kept on getting, see, composing is so much fun. Um, is so much fun that, you know, you have many techniques of composition and just writing it out is great. It's fantastic. And then when you start thinking about the end sound, you start doing things that maybe don't have to do with what the piece is. So that's exactly what happened to me. I started doing all these timbral explorations, which are fun, which are beautiful, which sound great, but didn't have anything to do with the piece. And so at a certain point, I said, wait a minute, I took a wrong turn. You know, the, it's, like, it's like a road that, you know, the piece is going that way. And all of a sudden, I just saw this beautiful thing on the side of the road and I turned off and I went somewhere else. And the problem is that I'm disrespecting the piece. Mm -hmm. If I want to do that, then I have to find another piece that wants to be about that. Right. That right. Be about that. Yes. So that's what I'm talking about. And, and how much... Uh, how much your attention right, triggers technology. Because no doubt, right, this uh, century is about a lot of uh, accelerating actually technological process, right? And, and technologies, but how much it, it triggers you as a composer, right? Well, um, absolutely. Uh, that, that would be the, the short answer, but I never give short answers. <laughs> so the first thing I would say is that I often see the gross mistake of people talking about technology like if it was something new, like if technology was only, I don't know, this digital technology. Technology is every extension that Homo sapiens and also Homo habilis uh, have done with our bodies. You know, remember that the, if, if you know people, if you've read Arthur C. Clarke or seen uh, the Stanley Kubrick movie 2001: A Space Odyssey. The first part of the book or, or the movie has to do with that, you know, with this discovery of technology. And that first technology is just a femur, a large bone with which one Homo sapiens kills another one. Um, and then it becomes, you know, he throws it in the air and it becomes a spaceship. So technology has always been around. This is just one more. There's yeah. nothing special about this technology. You know, a piano is a wonder of mechanical technology. Exactly. Um, I agree. So, so all sorts of technologies uh, affect me constantly. Yes. All of, them, of course. Um, so the, the technology behind, for example, a, a clarinet is fantastic. And that stimulates me very much. That being said, for example, I talk about the piano. There's this old idea that composers had to study piano which is ridiculous. It had to do basically with one syntactical system, which was, um, you know, tonal harmony, because tonal harmony could be very well um, resumed, brought down mm -hmm. to this, to what you could do, for example, in a piano. But for example, for nearly like, like 1,500 years before, all composers were singers because the syntactical system, you know, the modal system was basically an abstraction of the act of singing. So it made perfect sense to think through singing and not think through playing a keyboard. I would say that for the last century, um, electricity has been the main paradigm uh, shaping how we sort of define a perspective of thought for music. Um, so for the last century, electricity, and after the 20s and 30s, so almost a century of electronics, and for the past 
70 years um, um, well, digital, digital um, technology, starting, for example, with, I don't know, with uh, 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 the Iliad. It's lost, right? It's, it's computer. It's locked. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Early, early uses of, of computers. I remember the piece, the first piece, the Iliac Suite. I just forgot the composer, the American composer, who was the first one who did it. Um, Lajar and Hiller, for example, working uh, as a as a as a musician and as a composer, but also as a as a theorist. One might say, you know, he he started dealing with how the computer changes how we think about music. Then what what Xenakis did in the fifties and sixties, um, et cetera, et cetera. The computer really changed how we thought. But then afterwards, after the 80s and 90s, especially, you know, once the computer technology started being able to deal not just with the information, but the actual sound, then it also started affecting the structure of how we think about music. But I would say that for me, um, this uh, definitely the computer should be the equivalent of the, um, well, we study as composers piano, they say it's complementary piano. It's not for performance, it's yes. complementary piano for how you think about music. So I would say that now and for a long time, the complementary instrument should be the computer. Yes, yes, I exactly. Period. 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 And what is your, uh, let's say, most used uh, artifacts, technological artifacts, no, no, no artifacts? Laptop, uh, software, I don't know, Maxi, Maxi is, you know, Maxi, uh, pencil and paper. <laughs> the technology of pencil and paper is my most used uh, tool for composition. Um, I, I use the computer when I find it necessary and useful. Um, but the, the place where I feel most free in representing my ideas to be socialized, to be given to someone else, you know, if not, well, in my mind, of course, but to be socialized where I feel most free is with pencil and paper Good. and eraser. I make a lot of mistakes. So eraser. Good. So it's, it's three things, right? Three artifacts, a paper, uh, pencil, and uh, eraser, right? Exactly. Got it. And I have a whole bunch of different pencils and different erasers and different papers constantly around me. Because actually, many years ago, I worked um, with, for example, uh, notational programs a lot, especially one which disappeared, by the way. It was called, fin uh, not Finale, it was, uh, um, what was it called? I even forgot the name. It came out exactly at the same time as Finale, but but it lost the, the competition. Um, and uh, I, I, I became really good with that, uh, with that notational program. And I actually started skipping the, the, the process of, of writing in paper because I, could, I, I, I had such a good relationship and such a good control of the program that I started writing directly in the program. Um, what was it called? I can't remember. And um, after a few years, I realized that I was composing for the program that I was being and like uh, and marked by the program that it was being kind of controlled by mm -hmm. the program. Um, and I liked the results that were coming out and I had a very symbiotic relationship with, mm -hmm. the, with the program, very fluid relationship, but I needed to be able to break free. And so I abandoned the program and I went back to many different types of paper, pencil, pen also, um, and eraser. And I found that, that the different formats, the, the very different formats that I could use um, made my active composition feel more free, more alive. Um, and then when it's necessary, I go back to the computer, be it directly or with the collaboration of other people, whatever. Yes, good. And uh, looking back, right, uh, uh, you and yourself, right, how your music changed in the last 10 years? The last 10 years? Last 10. 
2010. Um, how has it changed? I have no idea. Um, I would go back to this idea that I very much concentrate on piece by piece. I do not want to develop a given um, style or aesthetic or technique uh, or, or school or whatever. Uh, you know, I don't want, I'm not interested at all in any sort of isms, you know, yes. it's very like, it seems very Parisian to, to invent your own ism. Yes. So, um, I'm not interested in, in, in that at all. So, so I would say that for a lot longer than 10 years, it's like one piece after another, after another seem very different. And, and in fact, a lot of people have told me that. And of course, that makes it hard to be a professional composer in a capitalistic world, because um, sometimes the, the person who commissions the piece, they commission it because they heard another piece and they expect it to be kind of like around the same. And maybe that's what, you know, like successful capitalist composers um, are successful because they define very well what, what their sound is like, mm -hmm. what their technique is like. So the person who's paying knows what he or she is buying. Uh, in my case, I would say that my, my failure in capitalist terms has to do with the fact that um, oftentimes what the, what the commission, the, the person who commissions receives is maybe very different from what they expected. Um, so I, say, I would say it changes constantly. Maybe I would say that my main change in the last decade is the fact of being with my partner, Melissa Vargas Franco, who's a, a wonderful composer and a thinker. And uh, whew, she just blows my mind day after day. And she invites me to think about so many things that have just moved my, 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 my floor, moved my mm -hmm. world. Um, so I would say I couldn't point what specifically has changed, but I know that, that my everyday thought has changed and has been profoundly enriched by living with Melissa. So, um, so maybe, you know, if somebody were, were to sit down and they would say, aha, in this last decade, these things changed, and I would say, yeah, that's thanks to Melissa. <laughs> okay, right. And uh, now um, two questions from uh, from composers. One uh, one question is from Simon Steen Anderson. Uh, hey. uh, but it's a question which I asked every uh, to uh, uh, every composer. <laughs> well, and he has a question. But you, as a composer, fears the most, right? Well, I wouldn't say as a composer, I would say as, as a person, um, suffering. Um, I don't think of any fears specifically as a composer. I mean, I'm so happy to be a composer. I, it's, it's the best thing in the world that I could imagine to be. Um, so my fear would be, well, being a composer, first of all, I'm a person. So I would say suffering. Suffering of the people that I love, suffering of myself, the suffering of people in general. That would be my biggest fear. And uh, next question is from um, uh, composer Francois Chalat. And uh, he wants to ask uh, composers, other composers, the question, why do you still compose, right? Oh, I think I just said it. I, it's the best thing in the world. I feel so, I wouldn't say happy or good. I mean, it's, it's hard. I mean, it's gut-wrenching. It's, it's like you turn yourself inside out. Uh, it's it's kind of like a self-imposed psychoanalysis. I've never done, I have no interest whatsoever in psychoanalysis, but, but I can imagine, or I sometimes imagine composition as a sort of auto uh, psychoanalysis and this whole effort of, of, of trying to, to put out 
my ego in a certain way. There's so many things. I mean, it's a lot, a lot of work. But I know that I, when I don't compose, when when too much time passes that I don't compose, I feel uh, a little bit dead inside. I feel empty. I know that something is lacking in my life. Um, and uh, composing, the act of, of composing really reminds me that I am alive. Um, so it's, you know, it's, it's, it's like, it's like eating. Um, I, yeah, that's exactly it. It's, it's nourishment. Yes. I feel the need to have. That's why I, I compose. And um, to your mind, right? Uh, looking on this century, right? On the last uh, 20 years, how new music uh, changed, right? How has new music changed in the last 20 years? Yes. Huh. Um, well, I would say that the last 20 years, of course, we're talking about the 21st century. There's, it's kind of like the, the backlash of this, <laughs> of this silly Y2K thing at the end of the 20th century. Everybody thought, you know, <laughs> the world's going to end because there's going to be some sort of collapse because of whatever, be it because of the computers resetting or because God is going to say this is the end or I don't know, just very silly ideas. Like if this was the only calendar in the world, very stupid, very self-centered. But in any case, uh, a lot of people were, were really worried or excited because the century is going to end and a new century is beginning. So I would think that <laughs> that this that if, you know, one big thing that has happened in the last 20 years is this silly ego about the 21st century. Yes. So we feel that, oh, we're making the music of the 21st century. Well, first of all, of course we're making the music of, you know, it's just, it's just another day. It's Thursday, period. Uh, and, and uh, you know, it's November and it's 2021 and it's 21st century. Wow, 2021, 21st century, whatever. You know, but th th this is, I think it's very childish. And there's this obsession with what with, with it's now and it's the 21st century. And we have to do everything that involves whatever. For example, we we're talking about technology, you know, yeah. the newest technologies. And then of course the music is going to be obsolete in five years. Same as happened in you know, decades and decades before, when everybody was obsessed with the newest thing. It was the first thing that became obsolete um, because it had to do obsessively with the idea of newness and yes. it's childish. Yes. And uh, looking as this right was, um, I guess, just I have a feeling that it was uh, in general, right, uh, towards uh, uh, new music, right, and landscape and changes. But if you would look particularly on Bogart, right, how is this? I don't know, community landscape change, right? In in these last 20 years? Yes. In terms of, of new music? Yes, in terms of new music. Well, um, it has changed a lot and it hasn't. First, I'll say why I think it hasn't. Um, first of all, because of what I said, we've always had um, Western academic music here and contemporary music is just the new things of that tradition so we've always had that so we've had i don't know for example atonal music since the 1950s we've had uh indeterminate music since the 1960s we've had performance art since the, the late 60s early 70s uh, electronic music since the 60s uh, live electronic music also since the 60s. Um, so, you know, in, in, in a certain sense, many, many aspects of how uh, new music sounds have been around here for the past 70 years, uh, since, especially since the 1950s. Um, the thing, again, is that many people are so ignorant and so lazy that they don't go out to listen to this music. 
but it has been here since the 1950s. Here, produced here. Not, I'm not saying, for example, listening to music from other parts of the world here, but I'm saying music that, that, that was composed and performed here. So we've had all these, uh, you know, uh, I don't know, like uh, graphic scores and all this stuff has been around here for many decades. And that is still going on. You know, electroacoustic music is still going on. Experimental music is still going on. Indeterminate music, uh, highly complex music, atonal music, whatever. Everything is still going on, I would say. So in a sense, there's a continuity of the last, what is it, seven decades? Um, there's a strong continuity. But something that has changed very much in the last 20 or 30 years is the access of higher education in terms of music, of professional uh, schooling for music that not only has affected, uh, say, academic music, uh, but also popular musics, you know, popular urban musics. So all sorts of music have been transformed by the fact that since the 90s, we've had an explosion of schools where we, we can have um, higher studies in music here. At, like, say, in the late 80s, you had basically, here in Bogota, one possibility, you know, the conservatory. In very few years, this multiplied into what we have now, which is at least here in Bogota, not in the, in the whole country, but just in Bogota, 12 different universities that offer uh, like uh, professional schooling in music. So that has meant an explosion of musicians, say composers, performers, but also audience and also uh, people involved in organization, people are organi uh, involved, for example, in uh, writing about music, thinking about music. So that I think has been a, 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 an important change and then we can trace it back to this explosion, as I say, of, of, of the possibility of schooling. Um, also, we've had since the, the, the late 80s, we had uh, increasing activity, concert activity around new music with uh, contemporary music festival, uh, the International Contemporary Music Festival of Bogota, which was created by Cecilia Casas, and also the activity of many programmers like Carlos Barreiro, who constantly programmed music, new music, both electroacoustic and uh, acoustic. Um, so all that activity, that growing activity from the 90s, especially onward, that has been like a, a huge wave that has created, that has made it possible to have an enormous amount of musicians coming out of the of the milieu here in Bogota and also throughout Colombia. Because I, I talk about Bogota, which is where I live, but we also have to think about Medellin. We also have to think about Barranquilla, Manizales, Bucaramanga, Cali. There's so many places where new music is, is really burgeoning and uh, bubbling forth with, with energy. So I think that's like a, uh, this really strong wave that has been growing, especially from the late 80s onward. And uh, very interesting. And uh, the question is, right, you mentioned uh, that there is some kind of uh, explosion, uh, not in terms of only musicians, not in terms of composers, but you mentioned as well as audience, right? Somebody who attends, right? Go listen or watch uh, music, right? And uh, who is it? Uh, like, I don't know, who are the people, right? They are, are they young or it belongs to more elderly generation? Who are audience of new music in Bogota? I would say that um, the audience is very diverse, both in age um, and in um, where they're coming from. Um, many, for example, whenever we, we have concerts, you'll see people who are 80 years old and people who even have to ask for permission to be allowed into the concert hall because they're so young, you know, five-year-old kids. Um, and the parents promise that they're going to be quiet and whatever. So very, very diverse. Maybe there's a tendency to, to have like a, a larger audience in terms of like kind of like college age, maybe in their late 
teens to their early 30s. Maybe that's a larger uh, audience, but, but it's really wide. And the idea of where they come from is very interesting because there's so much non-commercial music going on in Bogota. When I say non-commercial, I'm including not only contemporary music, but experimental music, popular music, because popular music does not necessarily mean uh, commercial music. Mm -hmm. So there's so many aspects of non-commercial music that many of the audiences of those musics, for example, of non-commercial uh, uh, punk, come to, to new music concerts because they feel the same idea of, you know, there's a search, there's a curiosity, there's a questioning. So they feel the same thing, maybe in some sort of, as I say, punk or, or rock or metal or whatever. And they feel the same sort of searches in experimental music, in contemporary music. Um, so a lot of them come from, from these different spaces. And in some of the music schools, yeah, for example, where I teach in the district university, it's an enormously diverse community of musicians because you have also a lot of people coming in from traditional musics. And when they're there, they're, they start learning about all these other types of musics. So for example, I don't know, I'm thinking of a, a student uh, called Magdaris that I have right now. She's a, a traditional harpist from, from the Janos, you know, from the, the Janero music. Uh, but now she's getting into all sorts of experimental and contemporary music because she ran into this in the, in the university, in, in the district university. And so those people not only become eventually performers of new music, but also audiences of new music. So it's, it's very diverse, it's very rich. Yes, and uh, speaking about uh, new music, right? Uh, let's say new music landscape in Bogota. What is your feeling? What are the trends? Where it goes, right? What are the what are the future trajectories? Let's say. Well, of course, it's impossible to. Of course, it's impossible to say to talk about the future is to miss. No. Of course, you know, yes, but, uh, this is exactly what's going to happen and exactly the opposite happens. Yeah. I will say one thing. Um, there's this thing with the pandemic, this damn pandemic um, is really affecting the most important aspect of music, which is the encounter of the community. You know, real live music, people in a shared space being a community through music. This has been very affected by this damn pandemic. And um, I hate it, I hate it. I mean, I, I used to be able to go up until the, the, the pandemic started to at least four concerts per week um, of many different types of musics. And, uh, and now, you know, we do have concerts for the last year, since November of last year, we started having concerts again. With, with this thing that social distancing and people can't be, you know, interacting with the musicians and there's so many limitations. And plus a lot of concert halls are simply closed. So I, I wonder what's gonna happen um, after this. Uh, this has affected us very negatively. One of the most negative aspects is this, this idea of, you know, uh, internet and Zoom and these horrible, online concerts, which is just all a big lie. You know, live music is a, a, has to do with the body and the other and the shared space, the creation of community. Yes. This, is, this, is a, this is a lie. And uh, we have to be very, very careful not to forget how important it is to be in a shared space with other people, single bodies becoming a general body. So this is good. This, it's not a trend, but something is going to happen in the next 10 years that has to do with this horrible thing that has been happening because of the pandemic. But do you think it will accelerate, right? That it will be new, let's say, new experiences, and there will be, like, let's say, more and more online concerts all over the world still going well, on? There have been, but I, I get the feeling that most people are bored because, because the experiences are not as transforming as the, the real live presence experiences are. So I think that um, we, we get more and more music 
but it's less and less meaningful. The experiences are less and less meaningful because music has to do about creating community. And, you know, being in front of your computer another hour of the day does not really mesh a community. Yes. Um, you know, this is important. The fact that, that we can that we can talk through through our computers is important, is useful, is good. But it's another thing. It doesn't replace, you know, if we ever meet physically, it will be a different and much richer experience. We can't forget that as humans. And the last question uh, is, what do you think, what is the role of new music in society, right? Well, I think I've, I've sort of said it uh, already. Um, I think contemporary music thought of as uh, we're talking about, you know, contemporary music of this Western academic tradition. Um, I think its role is to question, to ask about other possibilities of thought, of feeling, yes. of interaction. Um, I think that is the basic role, and it's a very important role for society because our society is our societies are so screwed up um, because of so many aspects. I mean, look what's going on in every aspect of, of, of social interaction. We're so screwed up that we need constantly to be asking how we can think, feel, exist, interact differently. That is the role of new music. So thank you very much for this exciting interview. Thank you very much, Sanders.